Angela, it's good to have you on the program. Good evening. Good evening, Pakasi. How are you? I am very well, thank you. So, women in mining, how's mining? It's challenging, but um, still exciting times mm. in the industry, yes. Mm. So, you're Chief Executive Officer of Nguvu Mining, is that so? That's correct. Okay, and uh, you've been mining for how many years now? Well, mining has been um, since 2017. Um, but prior to that, since 2001, I've been in the mining contracting business. So you could say um, I've been in mining for 23 years now, um, initially in mine services. Um, but I set up the mining, actual mining business in 2017 with, with the acquisition of of our first mine in Ghana, which was Adamus Resources. Mm. Women in mining, I mean, why would you first of all want to go into mining? Mm. It, was, it was not planned at all. I, um, I just got thrown into it um, by default. Um, I was, after I graduated from school, I joined KPMG um, in audit and my husband, um, who was into mining services, you know, had a business um, in Ghana that got into difficulties and, and so I was asked to, to come and help and, and that was really my introduction into, into mining. I, I thought I was going to do it for six months so I took unpaid leave for six months and technically I'm still on unpaid leave. I never went back. So this is in 2001 and that's when you had your first stint with mining and you've done this for over 21 years and then you decided to set up your own mining company in 2017 with a start of in Guvu. Yes and, and that, that is also another interesting story. I was um, with, a, with a friend in, in London um, who was then the CEO of Endeavour Mining um, and just over coffee, he asked me how I would like to own a mine in Ghana. You know, I thought it was a joke. Um, the next thing I knew, um, we were back at, at their offices um, negotiating the, the acquisition. And, and thankfully, I was able to raise money from you know, one of the banks um, to make that, that first acquisition. A year later, I guess this one went so well. He, um, he told me they had another mine in, in Mali for sale. In Mali? Yes. So um, the very next year, we, um, we acquired the second mine from Endeavour Mining. And, and a year after that was, was Niger, which was um, an agreement directly with the government of Niger to re, restart an old mine and, and revamp it. So how many countries do you work in? We're currently operating in three countries and um, producing in, in those three countries. And, and you mine what? Gold? Gold, yeah. And in total you've got how many workers? In excess of 3,000. In excess of 3,000 workers. Uh, are these direct workers at the mines? Yes. Wow, that must be very bold and audacious. I saw a clip of you um, about a month ago uh, where you were, I think, commissioning some new mining equipment was it in february this year yes that's um that's a model of it on the table liber liber okay. yes it's um the first of its kind in in africa they're um, a hybrid so they can run completely electric and basically fits in with our esg goals of you know being environmentally friendly um, so we, we have 13 of those trucks um, carry about 100 ton of material. And these machines are operating in all of your mines across Africa? In Ghana currently, in Ghana. yes. Okay. So, so which regions do you operate in? In the western region. Um, but we also have um, a mine that we're currently building a plant for in, in Konongo. That would be the fourth operating mine. Um, we hope to, um, to get that up and running soon. But, you know, mining must be very capital intensive. I mean, come to talk of the equipment used in mining, even, you know, managing a mine itself must be very capital intensive. How do you manage all this? 
No, it's, um, it's definitely the most challenging part um, of the business and, and being privately owned, it's um, a lot more difficult to, to raise the, the needed capital. Um, but we've managed you know, to, um, to get by. We have the support of quite a few banks um, here in Ghana who we work very, very well with. And so we've been fortunate in, in that regard. Mm. This has been largely male dominated. You've got other mining uh, firms managed by your male compatriots. Uh, how challenging is it as a woman, you know, navigating this field of mining? Mm -hmm. No, it's, um, it can be quite overwhelming actually. And um, I guess, for me, I, I just don't have a choice but to keep forging ahead um, because it's a huge responsibility to have, you know, um, to support businesses with, you know, over 3,000 people that, that rely on, on you to keep going. Um, I sometimes feel as, as though I'm not welcome in the space, you know, almost. Um, as people are just intrigued, I, I guess there aren't enough women doing this and, and I, I pray and hope every day that there would be more women that would make this, um, this bold step. You know, thankfully, um, in industry, you see a lot of changes. The industry has been very intentional about bringing women on board. Um, but back to your question, I mean, the, the challenge is, is that, you know, you, you're almost um, underestimated every time by your men counterparts and, you know, um, some can be pretty vile. Mm. Um, Have you at any point in time just decided to call it quit? Oh, yes, all the time. And, you know, my mum is my shrink. <laughs> so. Um, when I'm down, um, that's where I go, and you know she, she gives me the, um, the pep talk, mm. and yeah, uh, I mean I I've been told by some, you know, what are you doing in this industry? You should be modelling on the catwalk. <laughs> you can't match me boot for boot. Wow. Some have been quite by your male compatriots. In, indeed, and and yes. Um, it is tough, and, and especially when you, you consider the fact that you, um, we operate in other cultures in the region as well, some that don't really um, have too many women working, you know, by virtue of the religion or, or what have you. And yes, um, you have to, to show up and, and do what you have to do. Yeah. I know you're Ghanaian, um, many won't believe it because of your colour, but you're full-blooded Ghanaian. Um, I need to ask you about the business environment within which you've operated over the, the last few years. Of course, in 2001, you were working with someone. What, what has the business environment been like, you know, from 2001 up until now? You mean the industry? General industry, the regulator, the business environment generally, cost of credit. I think things have, have grown a lot, um, but at the same time it's become very challenging um, because policies keep changing. I think the, the positives I can see is, is in the, um, the local content um, policies that have been passed, you know, because prior to that, and, and I tell my counterparts all the time, when I first started, you know, about 20 years ago, I would always be in meetings with um, with expatriates, you know, they dominated. Um, whether it was in the chief executives, the heads, you know, was, um, and and our business itself had quite a number of expatriates. So in in that way, it's been very positive. We've evolved, you know. Now you hardly see any expatriates in meetings, um, and and then you know, Parliament passed the. Um, affirmative action um, law this year um, and so people are forced to make those changes and I, I say that you know that's um, that's a positive at the same time you know some policies um, have have worked against the industry and, and made things a lot tougher and it would be nice if if these policy makers um, engaged with industry a bit more um, I think that we would we would um, 
do a lot better with, with some dialogue. Are you political? Not at all. Why? I have no interest in politics, first of all. Um, and secondly, it's, um, it's a space where business people should just not play, you know, I think. Um, and, you know, I know I've been accused of, of being political, but um, the fact that I've worked through changes in governments all across the region should, should tell you that I, I am not. I, I just obey authority and I work with whoever is there. You know, we've been... I mean, if you've worked since 2001, it means you've transcended, you know, political regimes, you know, NDC, NPP. You must have friends scattered across the political landscape. Absolutely, and, and the same in, in other countries um, where, where, um, where I operate. And, and indeed in, in Mali and Niger, where, where I continue to work um, despite you know, the, the changes in, in regime to, to military. Um. So how do you build your influences as a woman? I don't think I build my influences. I just, you know, I'm a very collaborative person, naturally, and, and I, I guess it's, um, it's a quality that has helped, you know, um, because I, I'm always looking for that win-win situation wherever I go, and, and that sincerity pays off, because I'm, I'm not um, looking to take advantage, and I think that people obviously welcome so tell me about the communities within which you operate and, and the kind of influence you've, you've built in those regions. I, of course, I know you, you provide employment to a lot of the indigents there. What else do you do as a company? We, we take our engagement with our communities very seriously. Um, so, you know, we've, um, over the years, you know, always had a good relationship with our communities, um, done quite, quite a lot in, in our social um, in our CSR and yes um, I particularly I guess because I'm a woman um, tend to work a lot with our Queen Mothers as well um, and through that we've been able to to train quite a number of, of young women um, you know both in the mining operations as well as in unrelated um, businesses where you know they they are thriving at the moment. Mm. You've built community roads uh, send people to school, build hospitals. Are those part of your CSR obligations? They are. They are. They are. And we're passionate about education. Um, you know, we, in fact, we recently collaborated with, with one of the schools, an agricultural school, to, to set up a fish farm um, and, and a vegetable farm as well. And, and all our produce um, comes from that school. So, you know, there are quite a number of good initiatives um, in, in, that, in that space. And I'm very passionate about education and children. Mm -hmm. What challenges confront you on a daily basis? I mean, there's a lot of talk about Galamse these days. Um, and I can't help but ask you, um, as a woman who's operating within that field, how much of a challenge is, is, is Galamse or illegal mining? No, it's, um, it's taken up at least 50% of my time now. And, you know, it's, it's an absolute menace. I, I can't describe enough how, how bad it is. Um, because, you know, every day our security men go out and they're, they're in a battlefield. You know, we've had one shot in the eye. We've had recently with illegal miners invading invading and ready to kill yeah and 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 the kind of ammunition that they they bear is is quite astounding i mean it's um military style ammunition i mean they're in possession of explosives and and all that you know so um you know, and, and interestingly, the communities more and more seem to be advocating for um, small-scale mining, which, you know, um, is, is another added, you know, problem because they, they don't have the implements to actually carry out this work in, in most cases. And, you know, the um, environmental 
policies and you know the environment is is not considered in in some of these operations they're they're applying mercury to to the gold which seeps into the um, the water bodies and and the soil and and the like um, i mean there have been some good um, small scale operations around but you know where where we operate um, now it's it's actually quite quite devastating because gold is a finite resource so you know you could give them one area because they're not exploring at the same time they got that part of the land and they they keep moving you know and before you know it the the entire place is is um, is, is destroyed is it a menace you think can be tackled head on obviously um with with the willpower you know the will to do that but of course the government indeed uh, put in a lot of efforts you know from 2017 to 2020 we saw a lot of efforts by the then minister of of, of lands and natural resources uh, and we thought that it was going to be a thing of the past unfortunately it seems to be rearing its ugly head again this time causing more devastation than, than we earlier thought. Yeah, no, it's absolutely out of control. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't say otherwise. It's, it's out of control. Um, there is the, the, um, the talk about doing something about it. Mm -hmm. and, and I must admit, when we um, have these head-on attacks um, from, from these illegals, we do get assistance from the security agencies, um, more so the military um, you know, than, than anyone else. Um, but there are times when you know, we arrest these, these galamseers and send them to the police and they do nothing. I mean, they, they return everything to them, they, they release them. So there isn't enough of a deterrent, unfortunately. To, um, to stop it. Does this frustrate you sometimes? Very much so, because we, we feel as though we have no rights now. Um, and especially when the, the security agencies that are supposed to protect us fail to do so. And, and in some cases, our, our employees are arrested unfairly. You know, with, with one being arrested recently and charged with armed robbery. Really? was in the line of duty yes he's still he's still in custody but they let the perpetrators go mm -hmm. but it is it is a threat to our livelihood it's a threat to our lives it's you know it's and everybody can see that but, but even for people like you how much is it costing your business having to deal with galam sayers you know constantly invading your property and even killing your people how much of a cost is this to you it's huge i mean the amount of money we spend protecting our, our concessions is is incredible. I mean, we have almost a quarter of our workforce in security just to just to keep the place. A quarter? Yeah. Wow. What's the best approach to dealing with this canker? In your view, have you thought about it? It's, it's very interesting, you know, because as mining companies, we're very regulated, you know, we, we have inspectors come in, you know, from EPA, Mincom, and, and all of that. I think that there has to be some visible regulation of this, even if it's not some swoop from the military or whatever, but it's not obvious that, you know, these people are being discouraged from doing what they're doing. And, and that's what frustrates me. Do you face this same challenge in these other African countries that you operate, for instance, Mali, Niger? What's the environment there like? It's similar, unfortunately, very much so. And, and it's a security risk, you know, because you know, at least here in Ghana, we, we have, you know, some stability and, and, and safety. But in other countries, like in Niger, where terrorists are operating, it's a very easy way of making money. So that's the other scary part. You're still watching Business Focus. My guest is Angela List, Chief Executive Officer of Nguvu Mining Limited. We'll be back shortly.